Today, we'll shed a little light on our 32's wiring system and accessories. Hang with us while we hang some hardware. Today on Horsepower TV, we'll get back to our purple 32 street rod project by working on the wiring, the lights, steering column, and glass. In our race of the week, it's a streetcar shootout near Motor City, and we'll see who is the post street king of the hill. Plus, we'll show you how to replace that rusty old quarter panel without even using a welder. So hang on for Horsepower TV. Hi, welcome to the shop. Say, have you ever noticed how street rods, like people, have their own personalities? For example, this 34 Chevy sedan delivery has a high-tech temperament. Inside, it's got a fully digital dash, hydraulically lifted hood, and a fuel-injected small block underneath it. And with this compact controller, I can operate the locks, power windows, and even the back door. On the other hand, our 32 three window from Harwood has a different disposition with its nostalgia look. Now we've gone back to basics with these wide whites mounted on Halibran wheels, a manual hood, and three deuces on that small block Chevy. We also use this finned aluminum brake drum kit from SoCal that actually hides a disc setup inside. Of course, the horsepower purple paint and the flames make sure this is one pure retro ride, and that's why we call it the Grape Ball of Fire. Well, today we're going to get that rod ready for the road by installing the steering column, working on the lights, wiring, and gauges, and first, gluing in some glass. Now our windshield fits right in this channel here on the body and it's held in place with this urethane adhesive that you can get at just about any paint store. Now we're going to start by applying adhesive right here in the channel. All right, I guess you're ready for this now. Yeah, that's great timing. Now what we're going to do here is we're going to set that thing in very carefully. You bet. Put the top in first. There we go. Then slide the bottom in. We'll just hold it here for a few minutes while that urethane sets up. Of course, the back glass glues in the same way. Our hardwood body came with power windows, but since we want to keep the nostalgia look going, we're going to use these switches we got from Hotronics that look just like an old time window crank. That's up and that's down. Now they fit right into the inner door panels and connect to the wiring that we've already run into the door. Speaking of that, we're using a 12 circuit kit that we got from Painless Wiring. Now, cars like that 34 over there would probably need one of their 18 circuit kits to run all the extra gizmos. Now, I've gone ahead and run all the wiring to the accessory locations and under the hood. And I'm getting ready to mount the fuse panel right up here where the steering column will be. Now, I went ahead also and fabbed up this simple aluminum bracket to mount the ignition, light, and wiper switches. To keep things real simple under the dash, we put together this harness that connects all the gauges, and we finished off the ends with these plug-in connectors that came with our painless kit. Now, get a load of these white on black classic moon gauges. Pretty cool, huh? And we mounted ours on a trick aluminum panel that adds to the retro look. Now, the speedometer is electronic, and we'll show you how to calibrate it once we get the car on the road. Now, the gauges are pretty simple to mount. It's going like this held in place with a bracket. While Joe finishes up the wiring on our gauges, I'm going to go ahead and install our I Did It tilt column. Now, it attaches to the firewall with this plate down here, and it's supported up on this end with this billet aluminum bracket. Now, the electrical connections for the horn and the turn signals use this standard GM plug-in. And, oh, <laughs> don't worry about this ugly steering wheel. We're going to replace it once we start on the interior. You know, it looks like our painter thought we could use a dash of class. Uh, how do you like that pinstriping there, man? I'd have never thought that green would go so well with purple. Me neither. Tell you what, let me give you a hand with this wiring. All right. We start by plugging in the connectors. Then the dash is held in place with four screws. I guess when it comes to wiring, there are no shortcuts, right? 
<laughs> Stay with us. We're going to take a short break, but we'll show you what's what with our rod sliding right after this. Later on Horsepower, it's a Motor City Slugfest as you get up close with the quarter mile contenders of NSCA drag racing. Don't go away. For the latest news on Horsepower TV, check us out online at horsepowertv.com. Hey, welcome back to the shop. Well, we've got the glass, the dash, and the steering column hung in our 32. Now it's time to take a look at the illumination. Now, these are actually reproductions of 32 passenger car headlights, and well, yes, they were this big. Now, the only difference is these use high-energy halogen bulbs. Now, I'm going to take one apart to show you a little trick. By drilling a hole the same size as the socket, you can actually mount your turn signal right inside the headlight housing. There we go. Now, once the socket's in place, you install the bulb, then route the wiring right here behind the reflector. Then reassemble the headlight, and it's ready to mount. There, that'll do it. We're going back more than a half century for our taillight look. In fact, these 1950 Pontiac Repops work well with our nostalgic theme, and the round shape makes them easy to mount. Just a couple of screws and nuts hold them right in place. Now the headlights are held in place with a single bolt right down here at the bottom and it also allows the adjustment. Now the wiring is routed through this chrome loom here and hey, it looks just like they did back in the 60s. Man, these things look great. Well, we're about to wind up the wiring today and while we finish, how about a trip down to the upholstery shop for a look at some pleats that are hard to beat. Our poster, Denny Talon, is getting ready to cover some old Fiero seats with some new 50 style pleats. A process that starts by gluing cloth for a backing to a sheet of foam that'll become the bottom of the seat. Then he trims away the excess cloth. The foam is carefully marked to ensure equal sized pleats. Then Denny draws out the lines before cutting on each side of the lines with a razor blade. Of course, the secret here is to make the cut straight without cutting into the cloth backing. I can feel whether I'm at the sheet or not. And trust me, I've cut the sheet, but when I cut it, I knew I was there. I could feel that I'd hit it. After he's finished cutting, he pulls away the strips and the foam piece is ready. He takes a piece of the white vinyl covering we ordered and marks it where the pleats will wind up. Oh, by the way, those are the Fiero seats for our foundation there in the background. Now the upholster applies his magic at the sewing machine. Here he stitches the vinyl to the foam seat cover square, laying it in right in the middle of the cut. Well, there's one, and he just continues until all the pleats are complete. There you have it, pearl white pleats, just like back from the 50s. Man, that interior's got me in stitches. Now, we're gonna check back with Denny in a couple of weeks to see how he's doing on the headliner, carpet, and door panels, but in the meantime, hey, we're gonna charge ahead with our battery. Now, we chose Holly's Annihilator battery that takes advantage of the latest dry cell technology and cranks out an impressive 800 cold cranking amps. We're gonna install it back here in the trunk using their billet aluminum hold down. Of course, since it uses dry cells, we don't have to worry about venting any fumes. Well, I'll tell you one thing, I'm gonna be fuming if I don't get to fire this thing up. Hey, wait a minute now. I did most of the work on this thing, so it's only right that, well, I get to fire it up for the first time. Wait a minute, wait a minute, we'll flip for it, okay? All right. Heads you go, tails I go. Man, where'd that thing go? Looks like tails to me. Yeah, I tell you what, while Joe's having his fun, we're going to take a little bit of a break and you can take a look at this. Just ahead, we'll take you from the pits to the track. It's our race of the week from Mid Michigan Motorplex. Next. Horsepower TV's Race of the Week is brought to you by CarParts.com. Everything for cars, trucks, vans, and SUVs. Hi, 
and welcome to Mid-Michigan Motorplex. We're hot on the trail of another NSCA battle this week. This one's billed as a Motor City shootout. Let's get a sample of who showed up. A menagerie of fast machines in 11 classes came to race at this National Streetcar Association event. The top fastest classes, of course, Outlaw Street with a wild mix of blown and nitrous-fed seven-second cars, and Pro Street with a pack of the fastest six-second fighters in the nation. Other classes include Nostalgia Superstock and Pro Nostalgia, where we found the head of NSCA also behind the wheel of a 64 Hawkin Hemi Plymouth. The heritage of drag racing is very rich, and, uh, and you have to preserve it. I mean, uh, it. It shows where the rest of these classes came from, where the rest of these cars came from. So we think it's a good idea, and as uh, long as the NSCA is in business, we're going to keep that style of racing active. In Pro Street, Danny Scott was here to close the gap in the season's points race. He needs to make some stout runs in his 66 Chevelle to pull ahead. We hope to move forward some more there to uh, pick up some more points here and hopefully uh, win it if we can today, uh, tomorrow. But uh, we're, we're feeling pretty good about it. We was out here a few days ago testing. We'd heard it. We just prepared it last night. So uh, we got some bugs in to work out this morning. The Outlaw Points race pretty much belongs to New Yorker Benny Pacifico and his nitrous enhanced 63 bat. Came for this race number one in the points and uh, we won Bowling Green and hopefully uh, we'll do the best we can today and I'd like to, I'd like to win. Throughout Saturday's qualifying, the obvious pro streeter to beat was veteran Pat Musi in his Popeye spinach can Pontiac. So here we go heading into Sunday's eliminations. The top class qualifiers are Musi with a qualifying ET of 696 at 203 miles an hour, and in Outlaw Street, Benny Pacifico with a 733 at 186. Here on Sunday, there are actually two races to watch for, the finals later on, of course, and in first round qualifying, the race for points leader in Pro Street. Will it still be Scott or not? It will. In the first round, Scott's better reaction time helps him beat points rival Paul Dacry Point by a tenth of a second. So much for the points race. Now, what about Musi? We got a buy run this round, so if we do get aggressive, it'll be this round. It'll kind of tell us what we need to do for the next couple of rounds. So uh, we'll see what the track can handle this round. In back-to-back -back buy runs, Busey pours on the power with two 6'8 ETs at over 200 miles an hour. While Outlaw Street Wheeler Pacifico continued his winning streak with top runs in the low sevens, the Pro Street Finals were building up to a Busey scott battle. But it looks like Scott's got another race on his hands, a race against time to replace a torched piston. I didn't even know I heard it until I got back here, so we must have heard it right in the eyes. Did it make it? We're trying. I think so. Okay, good luck. We'll be right in the borderline here. <laughs> Finally, Scott and crew finished their pit side surgery just in time. But first, here's Vinny in his victorious win over Paul Catoni, who breaks in the finals of Outlaw Street. Now time for the big dogs to eat. Scott leads the line first, but can't hold the lead, as Musi runs a 692 at 202 to win one after many recent races as runner-up. It was good. It was a good race. I mean, I thought he had me more on the tree, but he didn't. It was, uh, uh, he had me by maybe three, four hundredths on the tree. I knew I was going by him. I mean, I just felt the car was just moving, moving, moving. You know? It's been running good all day. So put Pat's name on top for this weekend and put us down for the season finals of NSCA competition in Columbus, Ohio in a couple of weeks. Join the Horsepower TV crew March 10th through 12th for the IHRA Winter Nationals at Darlington International Raceway. 
Coming up, how to replace that rusty old panel without a lot of new high-tech parts. Chuck shows you how right after this. You know, I really like old cars like the 63 T-Bird here, but I absolutely love new technology. Now, today I'm going to show you how to install a steel patch panel without a welder. We're going to use Eastwood's No Weld Panel Repair Kit. Now, it includes these flangers, dimplers, panel holders, and their special adhesive. Now, you're also going to need some stripper discs to get rid of that old paint and a pop rivet gun to help secure the panel. Now, the old panel is going to come off with the help of this cutoff tool and a chisel, but hey, I'll tell you what, creative use of a hacksaw will get the job done just as well. Now, the first step is to identify the area that needs repair. Aside from this rust, we have an old area that's been repaired once before, and well, we want to grind it down to see what's underneath. Well, the damage turned out to be fairly extensive. In fact, we couldn't even grind all the filler out. So we're going to replace this panel from about here on down. Now, I've taken the replacement panel and trimmed it to size. We'll lay it in place right here. There we go. And we'll trace all around it. Now we'll trim the old panel one inch inside the mark. Once the panel's gone, strip the metal bare with the stripping discs on a drill. Next. Flange the edge of the old panel with the flanging pliers from the kit. Now we're ready for the final test fitting of our patch panel. Now if it doesn't fit quite right, we may have to do a little bit of extra trimming, but hey, this thing's looking pretty good. I guess we'll go ahead and start stripping the primer off of our mating surfaces. With the panel in position, drill your first location hole in the corner, then insert a panel holder and repeat the process at the other corner. With the panel secure, drill the remaining holes for the rivets an inch or so apart. Well, now we can remove the panel and use the dimpling pliers to countersink each hole. Wipe the mating surfaces clean with some Eastwood paint prep. Next, you can apply the adhesive in a quarter inch bead along the original panel. Install the patch panel with the panel holders to keep its position and begin installing the pop rivets. After letting the adhesive set up overnight, now we're grinding it smooth. And once that's done, we'll be ready for the body filler. We're using this metal to metal filler from Eastwood. Now, it's metal reinforced and it works easy, plus it doesn't attract moisture like other fillers do. Now, from here on out, you pretty much treat it like a regular spot repair. And hey, we're gonna treat you to hot parts right after this. Now, Horsepower's Hot Parts, brought to you by Summit Racing Equipment, your source for high-performance parts for 30 years. Say, if you're casting about for a set of iron headers, well, how about these from Sanderson? They fit 93 and up Camaros and Firebirds, plus the late model Impala SSs. Now, their rigid design makes them virtually leak-proof, and they got all the appropriate fittings for emissions equipment and computer sensors. Now, they're also a good catch for you street riders we have a little bit of a clearance problem. Now with this good looking airborne coating, they're $500 a set, $350 without it. These Scorcher TA tires from BF Goodrich are good looking too, and they'll make your machine stand out in any crowd. Now the colorful tread is available in red, blue, or yellow like ours, and it's designed to handle well in both wet and dry conditions. Now, they're sized to fit most popular sport compacts and trucks with speed ratings of both H and V. Of course, they'll rate well with anybody that wants to make a colorful statement on the street, too. Prices start at about 115 bucks. You can punctuate that statement when you mount them on American Racing's new version of their 200S wheel. This classic design has been brought back as a forging rather than casting for a wheel that's stronger, lighter, and available in a wider range of offsets. Now, you can get them in 15 to 17-inch diameters with widths up to 11 inches. 
Of course, be prepared to roll out about $175 a piece. Well, I hate to quit when we're on a roll, but we're out of time. <laughs> yeah, but we're not leaving before we tell you what's on next week. It's out with the old, in with the new. ZC4, that is. An engine upgrade that includes fast burn heads, a new cooling system, and high performance exhaust. Before we test the rear wheel horsepower results of this 70s Z28. Chuck puts his money where his seat is with an upgrade in buckets. Plus some cold hard facts about drag racing in our Horsepower Race of the Week. And remember, high performance fun is what this show is all about. Hey man, you got to fire it first, so I'm gonna drive it first. Hey, I got a quarter. No coin flips, no coin tosses, I'm driving. Oh man. For information about the products used in today's show and more, Check us out online at horsepowertv.com. Horsepower TV is an RTM production.